My Savior's love. Let's stand as we sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love seated. I told somebody that this while ago that wasn't here this morning that uh, there was joy in the room this morning. It's so nice to see that and uh, have that. Thank y'all so much. Um, announcements. Man, there's a bunch and I'm going to go over them again, but the flowers, aren't they pretty? They're very nice in memory of uh, Gene and Ted Hennington. Uh, mission rally tomorrow night. Now, new information on the mission rally. They're serving a meal at 6 o'clock. So instead of leaving at 6.15, we're going to leave at 5.30. Okay? Because we're not going to miss food. So, <coughs> so if you want to ride the, the van, you have two options. Um, you can, or three, actually. Uh, you can meet me here at the church at 5.30. When we'll leave at 5.30 from here. I'm going to stop and pick Scudder up so you can be standing there with Scudder and ride with him there. Or you can park at my house, and I'll stop and pull in there and pick up everybody that wants to park there so you don't have to drive all the way out here and, uh, and pick up folks there. So we'll make three stops on the way out of here and then bring you back, and I'll try not to forget to drop you off on the way back. So uh, <laughs> that's my problem there. <laughs> Too right. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, tomorrow night, that's, uh, the meeting starts at 7, but they're feeding at 6, so we'll leave here at 5.30 if you want to go to that. Uh, Awana, man, our numbers are going up. That is awesome. Uh, we can use a little help in the first 30 minutes helping uh, with Sparky's passing sections. We've got so many of them little suckers, and a lot of them can't read yet, so we have to kind of help them a little bit more, so it takes more people to do them. But uh, if you can help for just the first 30 minutes, that, that would be great. Uh, also, if you speak Spanish, I don't know if we've got any fluent Espanolers in here. But uh, we've got a couple of kids that, that they only speak Spanish. And it sure would help us to be able to communicate them with them a little better. So uh, maybe you know somebody that speaks Spanish that uh, we, could, we could trust with the translation and stuff that, that might you know, that's a good way to invite somebody to church. Hey, we could use your bilingualness. So, uh, crossover is starting up here before too long. Practices will start in November. Um, all the registration and all that kind of stuff is um, coming up. And while we're right there, I need to do a little bit of business. Y'all okay with that? Um, <clears throat> it's been requested that we uh, allow crossover to get it.
Uh, turkey and chicken fundraiser. I had a lot of folks ask me for tickets this morning. Thank you so much for that. Um, if you'll help us sell tickets, that, that's the way to do it. The people that you know, I'm going to tell you who, it's the, the, the folks who got to feed people. That's who the ones we need to get at because they're going to want, we're going to cook them on the Monday before Thanksgiving. They'll be good on Thursday. So uh, put it in the fridge or the freezer and then throw that dude back out and warm it up. It'll be great. If you can help with that, the money is going two different places this time. We're going to just split it in half. Half of it's going to go to the lowest circle to help pay for uh, gifts on the angel tree. And then also the, the youth ministries, the children's and the teens, will get, get some of that money. So anyway, uh, y'all help us with that. If you own a smoker, uh, a big one, we don't need no little tiny. I got lots of birds to put in there. Uh, so if you uh, have one of those or you know somebody who's got one of those that would be, allow us to use it that day, please uh, get in contact with them and me so that we can make arrangements for that. Also, if you're selling tickets, helping sell tickets, which I think teens should sell tickets because they're getting some of the money, right? And then uh, everybody else should help. So I'm just, that was just a plug for y'all selling tickets. But um, What was I saying? You ever do that? Huh? Teens should sell tickets, that's right. Um, but uh, anyway, it'll come back to me later. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Take them to school. You could sell them to teachers, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to tell you is there's a deadline to have those tickets turned in. I cannot take them after that deadline. You'll have to give their money back. So, that, and I'm sticking to that this year. I didn't do it last year, and I got burned for it. So, this year, deadline is the deadline. So, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we don't deliver turkeys. Okay. Yeah, you can deliver turkeys, but we, we don't deliver turkeys because we don't have time. Um, so anyway, that's going with that. that there's a, um, if you're selling tickets, I, you get a piece of paper that tells you all that stuff. Uh, fall Festival coming up the last Saturday of this month from 5 to 7. Uh, we need lots of trunks, so if you can help out with that, please put your name on the list out in the foyer. Uh, the mis tomorrow morning... I'm sorry, the Arkansas State Mission Committee is meeting here uh, to have their, one of their meetings, they have, they have two meetings a year, one of them they're having here. Uh, Tuesday morning, there'll be about 50 of them, we're, uh, we're hosting that. Uh, it's just a meeting, it's a business meeting basically, so um, there's nothing, nothing to come and see in here unless you just want to come and Let's sit through a business meeting. I don't know why you'd want to do that. But, um, but that's Tuesday morning. Starting at 9, we're feeding them at, at lunch. If you want to help with that, see Miss Martha. She's heading all that up. Uh, thanks to all of you who have volunteered to help, help do that as well. I appreciate it. Uh, and then Harvest Sunday is the 31st uh, of this month. Please be in prayer about what uh, you would give that day. All the, all the funds received that day go to the building fund. Uh, this evening after church, we need 10 round tables, 60 chairs, and one eight-foot table set up for Tuesday morning. So if you can stick around and help with that, it shouldn't take us but just a minute uh, to set that up in the Family Life Center. I hope that's all the announcements. So that's a lot to do, but we got a lot going on, and that's a good thing. Um, prayer request. Uh, James Murphy, uh, prayer has been requested for him, so please remember him in your prayers. Are the others over here? You got anybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's remember her. Anybody else? Okay, Scott's having his ablation done tomorrow, okay? So wait your turn. Anybody over here? <laughs> yes, sir. 
Amen. Anybody else over here? This section. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, okay. Neil. Rob Cox. Okay. Remember Rob. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Remember this. All right. Everybody good? Bobby, would you lead us in prayer, please? Miss Ann, you want to come? Come on. I'm ready.
praising my Savior all the day long. All right, let's sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. The teens are next. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leading on the everlasting arms. What a goodness, what a peace is mine leading on the everlasting arms. Leading, leading, safe and secure from all of arms. I want to encourage you guys, um, the folks sitting out there, sing along with them. You're going to know both of these songs, I think, that they're going to sing tonight. And that would probably give them a little more com com uh, confidence if we sang along with them. Also, I want you to do me a favor. Encourage them. Tonight, when you leave, go up to them and just encourage them. And uh, smile back at them. That'll help, too. All right, y'all ready?
bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to once again come into your house and to, uh, to worship you, to hear your word. Father, we ask tonight that you would be uh, with Brother Larry as he brings the message tonight. Help it to touch our hearts, Father, and penetrate our lives. and Help it to transform us, Father, into who you would want us to be. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome. Glad you're here tonight. Glad you're back. I want you to open your Bibles with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter the first chapter, and I want to talk to you for a few minutes about reasons for holy living. You may have been, somebody may have told you at some time or another that, you know, if I believed in salvation, that everlasting life, eternal life, if I believed in eternal security, then I would just be saved and just sin all I want. Somebody told my pastor that one time, and he looked at them right in the face and said, well, you know, he said, I do sin all I want, but God changed my want. <laughs> and that's really true. We do sin even as saved people. But man, no saved person is happy and joyful about sin that comes into his life. And that makes a difference. And I want us to look tonight and think about the difference between salvation and service is dynamic, and you know that there is a difference there. Salvation is by the grace of God without works of any kind. God saves us by His grace through faith in Christ. Service is what comes after salvation, and it's how we honor God and how we glorify Him with our lives in serving Him after we're saved. And the two are kind of separate, but in the Bible, I love the, the, the systematic, regular way the Bible presents things. And one of the things I know for sure is that salvation is always comes before service. Every time you see it, it's never reversed. It's never you don't serve God to have salvation. You have salvation, and then you serve God. And it's always in that order. In fact, somebody said one time, and I really love it, that we are saved without works of any kind unto works of every kind. There's a difference, isn't there? No works save us, but when we are saved, we are saved to serve Him, and we are saved to works of every kind. Many of you may know Ephesians 2, uh, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that none of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, then verse 10 says that we are His workmanship, His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. We are His masterpiece, His design, created in Christ unto good works. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, by grace we're saved, no works. Verse 10 says we are saved, we are His workmanship, and we are saved unto good works. And so they don't save us, but their result, good works are a result of salvation. And again, it's just, it just clear all the way through. In the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 5, said, not by works of righteousness which we have done, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so we're it's not our works that save us, but he says when we trust him with his mercy, then he cleanses us by the washing of the new birth, the washing of regeneration, and then he gives us the Holy Spirit of God. That's in Titus 3, 5. But three verses later in verse 8, he says, let our people remember to do good works. That's what Paul told Titus. And so when we think about salvation, works, and we think about service, being saved, and then serving the Lord, they just go together, and it's always, like I said, always salvation first, then service. This morning I was talking to you about, uh, from Romans 12, about Christ, and about, about the being saved, and then having a difference come in your life because of your salvation. And tonight in 1 Peter chapter 1, I want to begin in verse 13 and talk to you for a few minutes about 
reasons for holy living, and he gives three good reasons. And if you're, if you're thinking, well, you know, I know I'm saved, but why should I, you know, why should I serve God? I mean, if he saved me by his grace, and I know I'm going to go to heaven for sure, then why should I worry about how I live, about living a holy life, about serving God in my life? And I love what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. He said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope for the end, to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, or at the return of Christ. As obedient children, look at this, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Now, I think he's going to reveal, in fact, I know the scripture is going to reveal three good reasons why we ought to live a holy life. And the first one is you should live holy because first, God is your father. That's the reason you should live a holy life. You have a heavenly father who is perfectly holy and you're his child and you are to be an obedient child of your heavenly father. And so one reason to live a holy life is because God is your father. And if he is your father, then he sets the example and he sets the pattern. In verse 13, when he said, gird up the loins of your mind, he he's using an old phrase and that we don't really use anymore, but when he talks about girding up something, you're getting ready for a fight. You're getting ready for a battle. And in Bible times, when it said that they would gird up their loins, the loins is right here. Right here is a loin. And what they would do, because men wore long, you know, wore robes and things, when they would get ready to go into battle, they would reach under their garment, pull it up, and stick it, stuff it down into their, into their belt. And that would free their legs for running or for kicking or for defending themselves. When the, when the Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind, he's talking about getting ready, putting your mind in a shape where you're getting ready for action, for battle. And you know, the Christian life is, is not a playground. It is a battlefield. And the battle takes place between your ears. Before anything ever happens with your hands, before anything ever comes out of your mouth, before anything ever you ever do, it goes through your mind. And so he says, listen, gird up the loins of your mind, get ready, get strength for the battle that is ahead. He said, be sober. And he's not talking about sobriety from alcohol, even though that's included, but he's talking about be sober, that is to be tough-minded and self-controlled and have mental and spiritual discipline and not excess. And he says to be ready for the battle as a Christian. And then verse 14, I love this, and look at it in your Bibles. As obedient children. Man, are there disobedient children of God? Yeah, there are. I, I, I know that we can be obedient or disobedient. But he says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, and he said, not living by, by your old life, the former lust, before you were saved. You're not going to fashion your life. You're not going to pattern your life after your old life, but after your new life in Christ. Because, again, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you're a new creature. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. You're a new creator. You're a new, newly created, a new creature. And so what he's talking about here is obedient children. Saved people are born again children of God. God is your father, and you're his child by grace through faith in Christ. Now, here he's talking about being an obedient child of God. Now, you say, why should we live a holy life? Because God is your father, right? And you're his child. And here he says, as obedient children... And he's not talking about little toddlers. He's saying, listen, grown-up people, as children of God, be obedient to him. In fact, don't be a rebellious child. Be an obedient child of your heavenly Father. When this morning I, we were in Romans 12, and he said in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Then he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind 
that transformation, that change that comes in your life comes by His power through the Holy Spirit as you are saved and as you begin to give yourself to service and walk with Him. You become an obedient child of God. But I want you to notice verse 15. He says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be you holy, ye holy, in all manner of conversation. Because he is your father and he is holy, you are to be holy. Did you ever notice the way children take after their parents? We had a, a family in our church, the first church I pastored, that uh, name was Roth, R-O-T-H. And they had a son. Clifton Roth was the father. Stephen Roth was his son. Now, Stephen is today in, in Texas, and uh, he's a good, faithful church member over there. But years ago, I pastored in the San Francisco Bay Area, and this family was in our church. And one night after church, we were uh, my wife and I were talking, and we were watching Stephen. And his father, Clifton, had a certain way that he would stand, and I can't even imitate it, but, but he would just kind of stand just kind of in a peculiar way way. He would just, hey, my wife and I were looking, I said, look at Stephen. That boy, he was not looking at his dad, but he was standing exactly like his dad. He looked just like his father. And that's, that's okay. That's, that's all right. Because we look like our fathers. We are to pattern our lives after our fathers. Now listen, if God, he says, look at verse 15 again, as he which hath called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation. And that means in every avenue of life, holiness is to drift and is to affect how you live. And so when he's talking about in all manner of conversation, in all your manner of life, he's talking about in your home life, you are to be holy. On your vocational life, on your job, you are to be holy. <laughs> in your church life, you are to be holy because you have a heavenly father who is holy. And so he says, as obedient children, don't pattern yourself after your former life. Instead, pattern yourself after God, your heavenly father, who is holy, and therefore you are to be holy. When my wife was uh, growing up, she, her father, Boots Madden, was a pastor, and um, and one of the things that we've talked about many times over the years of being married, we've talked about our children in growing up, our kids growing up, and, you know, we just always prayed for our kids. And, um, in fact, uh, Ryan Marshall is here tonight, and he worked with my son Darren, right, at Jackson Builder Supply. Uh, when Ryan was in high school and was just a young guy, my oldest son Darren worked there. And, you know, we used to pray for our kids because Monticello is kind of a small town, and... Man, if the preacher's kid got out and got drunk and got messing around and did things, boy, everybody in the town would know about it. We would hear about it. And so we prayed about for our children growing up. And one of the things my wife told me was that her dad was a pastor in a small town in California. And Pat told me, she said, you know, one of the things that kept me from getting out and doing things other kids did uh, Deacon's kids. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. One thing that kept her from going out and doing things that other kids that she went to school with, you know, things that were wrong was her dad with the past. And she did not want to bring shame on her father. She loved her dad. She respected her dad. And she didn't want to do anything that would cause him to be ashamed and would bring shame on his name. You and I, we are to be obedient children of our Heavenly Father. We don't want to bring shame to His name either. And it's easy to do in this world. And so we need not to be disobedient, but we need to be obedient children of God. And as He is holy, so be you holy. Because in verse 16 He says, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. This command to be holy is repeated in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, several different places. In Leviticus, the Lord says, For I am the Lord your God. He's speaking to Israel. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. A few verses later, God says, You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And when a child leaves home, it's been a good practice to say, 
And I have to my, my kids, when they grew up, and they began to live, it was just, I've told Darren this and my other sons, especially my son, and I would tell them, remember who you are. Don't get away from home and forget who you are. You are a child of God. You're my child. And don't forget who you are. And as children of God, we are to be obedient to him. And he is holy. Man, that's why we ought to be holy. Somebody says, well, if you're saved and you're going to go to heaven no matter what, then why worry about that? Well, I want to be holy because God is my father. I want you to look at the second thing. We need to be holy also because Christ is our Redeemer. And he talks about this, beginning in verse 17. If you call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. And what he's talking about is he said God doesn't pick favorites. He doesn't, he, God is not partial to his children. Sometimes that is a plague in families when when there's a favorite son or a favorite daughter over other children in the family. And some of you may have been raised in a, phone, in a home like that, and man, that is difficult. Uh, it's, it's even difficult if you are the favorite <laughs> because you have siblings that are not. God isn't that way. God is our Father, and listen, He doesn't pick this one and that one and say, this is my favorite. That's what He's saying here. God is not like that. But He goes on in verse 18, and He says, for as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Let me tell you why you ought to live holy. Because God is your father and you don't want to shame his name because Christ is your redeemer. And he paid the ultimate price for your salvation. How could you ever how could I ever besmirch his name when he paid with his blood to save me? How could I ever just say, well, I know I'm saved now and I'm not going to worry about how I live. I'm just going to live any way. No, I don't want to do that. You know why? Because Christ is my redeemer. He paid the price. And I love in verse 18 and verse 19 that I just read, he said, you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You weren't saved by silver or gold, by your works or by your deeds or any good thing that you may have done. That's not your salvation. Instead, you were not redeemed with those things. But he said in verse 19, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb as a lamb without blemish and without spot. The price that Christ paid for our redemption is the greatest price. Price ever paid. Nothing was greater than the cost of your salvation, friend. Your redemption from sin, your salvation, your right to go to heaven, your right to eternal life was paid by the precious blood of Jesus. Several years ago, there was uh, the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir had a song, and I don't know the name of it. Brother Paul may know. Y'all may have sung this song at some time, but the, the chorus goes like this, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the, and three times, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, it cleanses white as snow, <laughs> and I just love that chorus in that song, the blood of Jesus cleanses white and as snow. We are redeemed. We are purchased from the marketplace of sin. Our sins are forgiven, and they're wiped out, never to be thrown in our face, never to be repeated. Our sins are forgiven because we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And then he goes on in verse 20. Look in your Bibles. Who verily, he's talking about our Lord Jesus, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. We have faith and hope that is in God because even before the foundation of the world, before the creation of the earth and the heavens, Jesus stood as a lamb slain. He was willing 
and God planned for him to pay the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate price for our sin by his shed blood. And he says here, that took place. It was verily ordained before the foundation of the world. Before any of this creation took place, God planned for our redemption. Wonderful, powerful plan of God. Our redemption, in fact, this payment for our salvation, for God to forgive our sins and God to save us completely, this payment was made by Jesus, and the redemption is the greatest price that was ever paid as of a lamb. And he was without blemish and without spot. So why should you live a holy life? Because God is your father. That's, a, that's one reason. Because Christ is your redeemer. And the third reason he talks about is because the Holy Spirit is your indweller. Think about this. It matters how you live your life as a Christian because it's a reflection on your heavenly father. You think it isn't? You ask somebody you work with, hey, do you think a Christian should do this, this, and this? People you work with may not, they may not have ever cracked the Bible. They may not even have known what the Bible says, but they will tell you, man, a Christian ought not to do that. A Christian ought not to drink. A Christian ought not to get drunk. A Christian ought not. Wait a minute, why do they say that? Because their expectations and their goals for a Christian many times are higher than the Christian's goals. Sometimes we're trying to figure out how we can be a Christian and get away with something, but the world looks at us and says, hey, if you're a Christian, man, your standards are to be up here. God is our Father, and Christ is our Redeemer. We ought to live holy because God is our Father, because Christ is our Redeemer. He paid the ultimate price. We ought to live holy because the Holy Spirit is our indweller. He lives within every believer. And every day you live and everywhere you go, the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you is with you. I don't know if you've thought about the fact that God's Holy Spirit is with you when you do the wrong thing. God's Holy Spirit is with you. When you, when you have the choice and you make the, the sinful choice instead of the godly choice, God's Holy Spirit is right there. And it grieves the Spirit of God. The Bible talks about that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit, when we receive Christ, He becomes our indweller for the rest of our lives. He indwells us. He will not leave us. But we can sure disappoint the Holy Spirit of God, and we can sure grieve the Holy Spirit of God by what we say and what we do, even as God's children. If you'll hold your place in 1 Peter, I want you to turn back with me just for a minute to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians the 6th chapter, because Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, says something that is so powerful about this indwelling Holy Spirit. I want you to know that he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he said, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I love the scriptures that begin with the word what and a question mark, <laughs> because it's kind of like this. What? <laughs> I don't know if the voice goes up, but in mine does. What? What? Don't you know this? <laughs> and that is the very idea. When Paul is writing him, he said, what? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the very Holy Spirit of God? Is a temple of the Holy Ghost? In fact, he is in you. You have him of God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price. What was the price? The precious blood of Christ, right? That price that was paid for your redemption, for your salvation was paid. He said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God, and you're not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And I think he's using that to, to get through to their, in their thinking that he's reminding them that, man, the Holy Spirit of God is living within you. And you are the temple of God, and you are not your own. Somebody says, well, I'll do what I want. A Christian should say, I'll do what he wants. That should be our first choice. Now, sometimes we do get willful. 
and we do what we want. But he says, don't you know that you belong to God? He purchased you, and you are body, spirit, soul, that you belong to him. You're not your own, and you're bought with a price. And man, that's a wonderful thing to know. Going back to 1 Peter chapter 1, I want you to see this in, in verse 22. He said, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. See how that Spirit is capitalized? He's talking about through the Holy Spirit. You have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the Holy Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Our souls have been purified in obeying the truth by the leadership, by the conviction, and by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit convicts us. I personally don't think anybody would ever get saved unless the Holy Spirit was convicting them about it. Because we don't really think much about our sin when we don't know Christ. We don't think much about it. But the Holy Spirit convicts us about sin. And in fact, the Holy Spirit convicts us. And when we're saved, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit seals every believer. In Ephesians 1.13, it says, after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You know what that means? That's a beautiful thing. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter who you are, if you belong to God and you've been saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And it's kind of like a seal is a sign of ownership that you belong to God. A seal, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And not only that, but the Bible teaches that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. If the one who indwelled Christ, the Spirit who indwelled Christ indwells you, he that indwelled Christ will also raise you, who raised Christ will also raise you in the resurrection day in Romans 8, 11, it teaches that. So the Holy Spirit seals us, He indwells us, He convicts us, He guides us. In John 16, He talks about the Comforter that would come, that would guide into all truth, that would reveal the plan of God, God's Holy Spirit. Because we are born again, and what He's saying here is we will love others because not only God is our Father and Christ is our Redeemer, but the Holy Spirit is our indweller. In verse 23, he goes on in verse 23 through 25 to talk about how we are born again by hearing and believing the word of God, the gospel, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. The truth of it is, friend, that, friends, that tonight we have to think about living a holy life. And I'm not talking about being holier than thou. We talk about that. Oh, what is it? he's holier than thou. No, we're not talking about trying to be holier than anybody else, trying to look better or to wear a halo and every act. You know, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is living a life of holiness. Just you and God and doing the things that please Him. And we ought to live holy lives and we ought to strive. We can't live perfectly, but we ought to strive to live holy lives because God is our Father and Christ is our Redeemer and the Holy Spirit is our indweller. Isn't that something? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. All three, the three in one, had a part in your salvation because the Holy Spirit convicted you, God the Father loves you, Jesus the Son died for you. And those three in the Godhead, not only did they provide for your salvation, but they also are the reason you are to live for God as his child, as an obedient, as an obedient child. There's one verse of scripture, and I had it on our PowerPoint, but um, we don't have that. But 2 Corinthians 5 15. I love this verse. If you can turn there, I want to close with this. 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 15. That's a powerful chapter of 2 Corinthians 
in chapter 5, but I want you to see what he said in verse 15. Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That verse is so powerful, and here's what it, here's what it means to me. He died for all, that they which live, and we're talking about we who live, he died for us, that we who live should not henceforth live unto themselves. And the word henceforth is a beautiful word. To me, it's kind of like, here, here's your life. And he said, Jesus died for us, that we henceforth, when we come to Christ, that we henceforth not live unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. That's who we live for once we know him as Savior. And the thing that he challenges the Corinthians with and he challenges us with is how are you living your life? We are to be living our life for him who died for us and rose again. And I hope tonight that first, that you know him as your Savior. Second, that you're living for him. And I want to challenge you to live a holy life because God is your Father, Christ is your Redeemer, the Holy Spirit is your indweller. Would you please stand, and we're going to sing an invitation number. I don't know your hearts tonight, and maybe there's someone.